This is Dallas. It's not on an ocean, it's not on a lake, and the Trinity River that snakes through it is hardly navigable. But 130 years ago, as the Plains town was finding its footing, Colonel Henry Exall stood before City Hall and announced that making the 710 mile path of the Trinity navigable from the Gulf of Mexico to Dallas was not only possible, but essential for the city's future prosperity. The Army Corps of Engineers built seven locks and dams, but World War I halted all construction. Over the following decades, the project was nearly revived several times before voters finally put a nail in its coffin in 1973, leaving the completed but never practically used locks and dams left to nature. Let's explore the fascinating modern day remnants of the grand and ultimately unrealized vision of the Port of Dallas. Let's start with just how crazy this whole concept was. As the crow flies, Dallas is 240 miles from Trinity Bay, but following the river's path nearly triples this distance. Much of the river was too shallow to traverse, and obstacles from sandbars near the gulf to down trees and rapids further inland made the trek treacherous even for the smallest boats. But during the 1840s, the idea of making the Trinity navigable to Dallas was gaining traction, following a wider trend of water freightway building nationwide. The city got the Corps of Engineers to fund a survey but failed to obtain federal support the following decade. Boat traffic, however, did grow on the downstream end of the Trinity River up from Trinity Bay. Some of these vessels would come within a few counties of Dallas, but it wasn't until 1868 that the first boat arrived from Galveston after a painstaking one-year journey up the river. Note that railroads did not reach Dallas until 1872, meaning that prior to this, without a canal, freight was hauled here by horse-drawn wagon. In 1891, a group of prominent North Texas residents formed the Trinity River Navigation Company with the goal of getting a navigable waterway to Dallas. In a ploy to build support, James Maroney, son-in-law of the founder of the Dallas Morning News, sailed from the city all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. He was the key speaker at Exhall's publicity event in 1893 and quickly became an investor in the navigation company. As proof of concept, the company sailed a 113-foot cotton barge up the Trinity to Dallas the same year this time completing the journey in just over two months. The H.A. Harvey's arrival was celebrated with a parade and gala, reinvigorating the fight for a navigable trinity. In 1899, Congress caved to the push and authorized another Corps of Engineers survey of the river, resulting in a proposed dredging to six feet in depth and the construction of 37 locks and dams along a straightened 500-mile path. Seven years later, construction started on the first dams and locks, the first lock was completed in 1909 at Macomas Bluff in what is today Southeast Dallas. Seven dams were built by the Corps of Engineers before the start of World War I, referred to by their position going downstream from Dallas, numbered based on the original 37 dams they intended to build. Macomas Bluff, the first dam completed, is number one. Six of the original dams remain in some state today. Two and four still have remnants, but with the main dam structures broken, allowing water to move freely. Number 1, 6, and 7 are in fairly good shape, with the main dam structures remaining intact. Some of the adjacent locks are blocked by a mix of river obstacles, while others flow free, although the wooden lock gates that once adorned them are all long gone. I was able to get to 1, 2, and 4. 6 and 7 are in very good shape, and I would love to see them, but unfortunately, because of where they're located, I can't get there without a boat. Thankfully, others have paddled the Trinity through all the locks and dams taking extensive photographs, and I'll link in the description to some of their media. Number 20, located near Crockett, is also in good shape and is accompanied by the aptly named Lock and Dam Marina. I didn't know where this one was until after I filmed, but it is the most accessible of all the locks and dams and one of the only ones visible from a public street. Number 25 was also allegedly completed, but I was totally unable to find it. The best information I found placed it seven miles from Trinity, Texas, which could mean it got swallowed up by Lake Livingston. The start of World War I stopped construction on the Trinity Project, but the end of the war wouldn't save it either. The Lock and Dam Project was formally scrapped in 1921, deemed too expensive. It would be the following decade when the idea started gaining serious traction again, and as happened previously, it was pushed by businessmen unhappy with rail freight prices. The Dallas and Fort Worth Chambers of Commerce sponsored the Trinity River Canal Association, which later became the Trinity Improvement Association with the goal of solving not only Dallas's navigation problem, but also the unconstant and occasionally treacherous waters of the Trinity River. 
Although Dallas did not get any new locks this time, the push did succeed in an insane reimagining of the Trinity through North Texas. Starting in the 1930s, the Trinity was encased in levees on each side of a massive dedicated floodplain, as well as three new lakes for flood control, all designed with future navigability in mind. Unlike in Austin or San Antonio, the Trinity River through Dallas generally repelled development. Until recently, the whole floodway was an unmaintained no man's land. The full scope of the Trinity Improvement Projects wasn't completed until 1963. And also in the 1960s, over 50 years after the first lock had been completed, the Corps of Engineers came back to the table and proposed an even straighter 335 mile route that would be 150 feet wide and 12 feet deep. But as the plan grew, so did the opposition and from an unlikely collaboration of people. On one hand, were environmentalists concerned with the ruining of the Trinity River ecosystem, and on the other, an anti-government waste cohort that saw the project as a doomed-to-fail boondoggle. After all, it had essentially failed twice already. In 1965, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed a bill allocating funding for the Trinity River project, but it quickly came under scrutiny as the budget and timeline provided were unrealistic. In 1973, the Trinity River Authority requested a $150 million bond from voters, a small part of the growing billion they needed. The measure was solidly defeated, with opposition strongest in DFW, and the dream of a navigable trinity has ever since been killed. Today the dam stands scattered southeast of Dallas as a tribute to an ambitious concept, one that for better or worse never materialized. How would Dallas, even Texas, be different if it had worked? Would Dallas have been better off or worse? Discuss in the comments. There's some great media on this including a wonderful 99% Invisible episode that I'll link in the description. It's definitely worth checking out. As always, thanks for coming with me on this adventure. Subscribe to the channel and join me on the next one.